Now we get to watch. Oh, she's drinking juice now. My fan club's up here. Not watching me now. But it's good to be here. It's good to see everybody. We're continuing our study in Psalm. We're looking at the 138th Psalm this week. Uh, I read a couple of different commentaries this week, and uh, like a lot of the Psalms, there's not really a consensus as to who wrote it sometimes, or what the occasion was, or what was going on, but, and that's what, in our intro here, he says, this is ascribed to David, but the circumstances are unknown, and I was reading another commentary that said this was, and it, it fits in my mind, that this was probably... David probably wrote this uh, when he had become king of a united Israel, when he was king over, the, over, over all of Israel. And, and then you think about those that are uh, uh, his enemies or, or what have you, but you're looking at the Jebusites, the, Phil the Philistines, and the Moabites. They... Uh, they all preferred a weaker Israel. They always preferred when there were two separate kingdoms when they broke up. But, but here we have David over a united kingdom. But this is a personal prayer of David's. He said psalms like these are really made for us to use in our prayers. And especially this one to praise the Lord. So a lot of David's psalms are prayers, is what he's saying. And, and it's something that we can use ourselves. We can take this psalm and we can apply it to ourselves, to, to our lives, and, and as a, a prayer to God. But the first three verses, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answered me, and strengthenest me, with strength in my soul. So the first verse here, he says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise. It's not David talking about that he believes in gods, but the word that was translated to gods here, it specifically means leaders, uh, leaders and kings of the earth, of the known area. So he's talking about about the kings in the surrounding area, and not just the kings, but also anybody that's listening. So this this word is, is really encompasses a lot of people, and what we get from that. So he's saying, before everybody, will I sing praise unto thee? David is not timid or private about God. He's telling everybody about God. He wants to tell everybody about God. He wants to sing God's praises to everybody that will lend an ear. And even those that didn't come to hear, he's still sharing it with them. He's still telling them about it. And then two, I will worship toward thy holy temple. Now you know that if this is David writing this, and it's about a time when he's king over united Israel, well, there's no temple because David didn't build a temple. He collected the items and his son Solomon, when he's king, he will build the temple. So, but this says, I will worship toward thy holy temple. This word again can be translated as tabernacle. And it might be the tabernacle that's in, uh, in Gibeon. Or it might be whatever location the Ark of the Covenant is in at this time. Because that's where God's presence is. Here with the Israelites. God's presence on earth is wherever the wherever the Ark of the Covenant was. And we talked about the, the various places that the Ark wound up being before it was brought to Jerusalem and before the temple was built. So David is saying that he turns to God. I will worship toward thy holy temple. I will turn to you, God, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. And in our text here, he tells us. David praised the Lord for his loving kindness. This word is arguably the richest of the Old Testament. Translating the Hebrew, Hebrew word, I don't know, it's C-H-E-S-E-D. I don't know the proper way to pronounce that word. But it combines all the qualities. And that's what, some of these words are amazing as to what all they can mean. It combines 
God's qualities of love, mercy, grace, favor, goodness, kindness, compassion, faithfulness, loyalty, and more, all into one word. And, and, and we try to make loving kindness cover all that. And so whenever you think, that, and wherever you use the word loving kindness, or you seeing that someone described that way, think of all these qualities. Love, mercy, grace, favor, goodness, kindness, compassion, faithfulness, loyalty. And then he says, and more. He doesn't even leave it there. So think of anything that's a great quality of someone that ex exhibits towards someone else, and, and there you go. It's, it's all a part of that. It emphasizes God's unfailing love, who is always merciful, gracious, and good to us. If we just consider this one word, we have an eternity's worth of praise to give our God because this is how God feels towards all of us. And we've done nothing to deserve it. But that's what David is saying. And I praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And in that, that last part of that there, it says, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Um, some people get a little, I, I was reading in some different commentaries, some people get a little um, confused maybe as what that means, but what I found that really just said it all out there was David is saying, I trusted your promises and I prayed. And, and that's what we do towards God. We trust God's promises and we pray. When we have a problem, we trust God's promises that he made and we pray. When things are great for us, we trust God's promises and we pray. When something comes, when, when we encounter something and our first inclination is, what should I do? What do I do? How, how, how do I deal with this? What, what now? Our first inclination should be, God, I trusted your promises and I'm going to pray. And then he goes on to say, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name, meaning, and the Lord answered above and beyond anything he promised. So we think about God's promises to us, to mankind, to, to all those who answered and all those who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we think about the promises that he made and we pray to God. And what does God do? He answers above and beyond any promise that he ever made to us. I mean, it's just like it never ends. And the comfort that we can find in that. And, and then in verse 3, In the day when I cried, thou answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. David is probably remembering a specific day and an immediate answer that he received when he writes this. And the day that I cried, you answered me, and you strengthened me, and you strengthened my soul, you strengthened my resolve, you gave me the a will and the ability to move forward, to continue on. God's strength was poured into his soul. Now think about sometime in your life when you just thought there was nothing else. You're at the end of your rope. Your wit's end. You have nowhere else to turn. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. And you turned and you did what God asked you to do. You, you turned it over to him. You prayed to God to give you the strength, to give you, to answer you, to, to show you what to do. And have you, have you done that before and you felt what David feels here? I know everybody in this room has been there and everybody's done that. Now why we don't, we sometimes let that fade in our memory and we have to remind ourselves that that's what we're supposed to do. But that's what God wants to do for each and every one of us. When we don't know where to turn and we, we're we looking for where to turn and we remember that, oh, God's where I'm supposed to turn, we'll find ourselves just like David here. God will answer us. Because he just said that God answered us above and beyond what he had promised. And, and 
the same thing. God will strength. God will just pour strength into your soul to get you through it because there's all kinds of things that encompass us and, and, and take us on and we have no ability in our own strength to get through any of this stuff. But it's only through what God gives us, the ability. And that's what he's talking about here. Those times when you thought there was no hope, no nothing, and yet you prayed and and then that feeling inside when when God does that, it's just indescribable. The comfort and the the, the, the calm and the peace that you feel. He says in our text, many times David thanked the Lord for hearing and answering his prayers. Too many give too uh, <clears throat> give too little thought to the value of the Lord's hear the, the Lord's hearing our prayers. Consider for a moment the number of prayers the Lord hears on a daily basis, and still he hears ours. That should amaze us and motivate us to praise the Lord even more. We can be assured that the Lord hears our prayers. Our prayers. He may not always answer them to our liking, but he always answers them for our good. Many times David cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard his prayers and delivered him out of trouble. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. And never think that what's on your mind, what's concerning you, what's what's before you is not important enough to ask God, to share it with God, to lift it up to God in prayer. Never think that out of all the people of this earth that are praying, just like we said, you know, how we never need to sell the power of God short. Because we cannot fathom, we have no understanding what God can do. Just like what he said there, above and beyond his promises. We can't imagine what God wishes to do for us. Because whatever it is that you think of, God wants to do above and beyond that. Whatever you ask God for, when you go to him in prayer, He's going. he wants to give you above and beyond that. Verses 4 through 6. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. They know what God promised. And they see the prophecy fulfilled. When they know the promises that God's made and they see the prophecy, all the kings of the earth shall praise God. And not only in this time, but in the coming of Jesus Christ when he comes. It's, it says so in the Bible. Every knee will bow. Everybody will recognize Jesus Christ for who he is. Whether they accept him as their savior or not. And this is something that maybe might slip our mind from time to time because we're always concerned about what Satan's trying to do to us, what he wants to do, and he rules this earth and he's always interfering or meddling or you know just trying to distract us. Whatever you want to say he's trying to do, he does. He's there. But he knows God's word Better than we do, probably. Or as well as we do. But he knows God's word, word for word. He knows it. And he too is going to have to bow down. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of thy Lord. Also in this, in They're going to recognize the Lord. They're going to recognize Jesus Christ. And then to think that every nation that has ever opposed and persecuted Israel has gone down in defeat. Every nation that has opposed and persecuted Israel has gone down in defeat. And there's still some to come, but they will all go down in defeat. 
And then I also read this in one of the commentaries. The messianic hope of Israel is the only hope, is their only hope, and the only hope of the world. Jesus Christ is the only hope of the world. Jesus Christ is the only hope of Israel and the only hope of the world. He tells us in our text here, sadly, Israel failed in this role. As he said, as David and Israel promised, praise the Lord is an invitation to foreign nations to praise the Lord also. And Israel failed in that role by the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. He for, they, for, they forbade, the, the Jewish leaders forbade anyone but Jews to worship the Lord. At the cleansing of the temple, you, temple, Jesus vehemently scolded the Jewish religious leaders and reminded them that the temple was to be the house of prayer for all nations. You remember when he went in there and upturned all the tables when he threw everybody out and the money changed out? You remember the time that Jesus showed his anger? There's nothing wrong with that. That was not sin. That was Jesus being angry because he... Sometimes you just get fed up with all the lies that are spewed out there by those opposing God. And sometimes you got to call them out. And that's what he did. If the temple was for every... I'd never thought about it in that terms. I always thought the same thing that the Jewish leaders were trying to tell everybody else, that the temple, God's presence here on earth, was for the Jews. But it was not. It was for anybody and everybody to go and worship God. That's what the temple was for. Be it a pauper or a prince or a Jew or a Gentile, all should praise the Lord and we should invite others to join us in our praise. Our church is the same way. Our church is for any and everybody that wants to come and praise God and worship God and, and study God's word. We don't have a list of at the door of somebody's garden and telling who can and can't come in. We have somebody stand at the door, kind of watching for folks to make sure that this crazy evil world doesn't try to do something foolish. But the temple was for everyone. God's house is for everyone. Worship. Though the Lord be high, yet hath yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Praiseworthy is also how the Lord gives a nod to the humble, but completely rejects the proud. Both James 4 6 and 1 Peter 5 5 tell us that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Quoting Proverbs 3 34. This is completely and typical to the ways of the world. The world says to get ahead in life, you must strut your stuff or ring your own bell. The Lord tells you to humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So who do you want to be, who do you want to use as your example? <laughs> Stars and anybody and everybody, the, the media portrays as a great person, somebody that we should aspire to be like and to lift lift ourselves up to be like them and to to listen to them what they have to say because they're all knowing and they they've got our they know what's best for us and, and all this stuff. We wanna to listen to them, the proud, or do we want to listen to the greatest example that ever walked this earth? The greatest humble example to ever walk this earth was Jesus Christ. He came and he, Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth. He was, it's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All three were present at the foundation of the world. All three were present when creation, at creation, Jesus Christ, I mean, you know, if, if if somebody comes to our house where we're, that's our house, so we're in charge. If if we have a, uh, yeah, 
when you go hunting anywhere, but particularly out west, you have to be extremely mindful of property lines because if you step over the wrong property line, they're going to raise their, they're going to lift up, they're going to, you know, they just come at you. There's no, no one's humble about that. It, it's so terrible that most of you probably aren't really interested in technicalities like this, but in Wyoming, there's public land <coughs> and there's private land. And a lot of this land, when they when it was divvied up, they did it in a manner that the people that were buying the private land could control public land without having to pay for it. They could buy land and pay for half of it, but control twice as much land because it's all in one square mile checkerboards. Here's private land, here's public land. Here's private land, here's public land. Okay, so then you think, well, this is public land, and right over here is public land, and it comes together. Like the four corners in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, Utah. You know, you stand in one spot and stand in all four states at the same time. So you think, okay, well, I can just go into this public land and go right up to the corner, and I'll just hop over into the other public land, and there's private land over here and public land over here. That's against the law because they view it as though there's a wall going straight up and you can't cross their wall to get over into the rest of that public land. It's called corner hopping. You can't, there's, there's people that would take a ladder, one of those ladders that's shaped like this and they would set it over here and set it over there and climb up the ladder and climb down the other side and stay on Public land and stay off private land. They got thrown in jail. Climb over the wall. <laughs> yeah. Climb over that invisible wall. But it was it's theirs, they claim. And they're in charge and they're gonna make the rules and they're gonna say what you can and can't do. Jesus Christ created everything. He's walking this earth and everything is his. And he's the most humble example that ever walked this earth. He gave his life for all of us unworthy people. But he's the perfect example. And the Jewish leaders in Jesus' time that were keeping all the Gentiles and anybody and everybody that they didn't approve of out of the temple, they were the proud that God saw from afar off. They were the proud that Jesus saw from afar off. The ones that, that hung him on that cross. Verse 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. The, verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, David in his time, he's surrounded by all kinds of foes, hazards, and distresses. Thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. God enabled him to walk safely through all of those adversaries as though they didn't exist. He could walk right through them although the, as though they didn't exist. The same hand that strikes adversaries saves from disasters. David always turned to God. He would turn to God when he find and God would deliver him. Jesus Christ, when he when he called the demons out of that herd of pigs. And those pigs ran off the cliff and into the into the sea and the field, and all the local people gathered up. They were all mad because he just took away part of their livelihood. He took away their food. He, all they're looking at is this guy right here just sabotaged our whole our whole herd of hogs, pigs, whatever you want to call them. And they were there. They wanted to throw Jesus off that cliff too. They looked straight at him and they were ready to throw him off and, and do the same to him as he did to those pigs. You know what he did? You know what he did. 
He turned, he looked at him, and he walked right through him. That's the same thing that he's talking about here. Jesus Christ showed us the example. He trusted God, and although they were his adversaries, he walked right through them. Now, he could have done the same thing on the day he was crucified. Those people had no control over him. Pilate had no control over him. The soldiers had no control over him. The beatings that he took, the, the soldiers that beat him had no control over him. They couldn't make him carry his cross if he didn't want to. And then someone else did carry it for him. They had no control over him when they nailed him to that cross and hung him up. They did not control Jesus Christ, our Savior. He allowed it. They had no control over him. They did not kill him. He gave his life. They didn't kill him. He gave his life. That's what he's talking about here. It doesn't matter what's coming at us. It doesn't matter the problems that we find befalling us. It's got no control over us if we turn to God because he has control over all of it. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. He says here that it's uh, spoken of in Philippians 1 6 as well. Uh, where'd it go? As all the verses of Psalm 138 hold beautiful precepts, the verse 8 reminds us that we can be confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 1 6. The Lord had made a promise to David called the Davidic Covenant that his throne would be eternal and his son would build the temple. David was sure that the Lord would, come, would keep his promises because in his final days he said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. The Lord fulfilled the latter with Solomon, completing the temple, and will fulfill the former with the coming of Jesus Christ, who will sit on the throne of his father, David. Jesus Christ will sit on David's throne. That's the, the throne that God promised. God, where it says, forsake not the works of thine own hands, where David's asking God not to forsake the work of his own hands, God Never can, nor will he ever do that. And as he says, it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I like these short songs. We get to, you know, like, I, I say, oh, there's only eight verses. How can we make that a whole class, a whole lesson? But when you get to looking at it, it's just so amazing. It, God's always amazing when we stop and we focus on him and we look to him and we we study what he wants and we, we look at what he's asking us to do and what he wants from us and what he wants to do for us. He says here, <clears throat> excuse me, I got one of them nagging canker sores right there on the side of my tongue. <coughs> kind of makes me. And, and gargling salt water, I've been doing that too. That's so exciting to gargle salt water. <laughs> it helps for like 13 seconds and then it's right back. <laughs> Psalm 138 is full of praise and confidence. Maybe the two go together. The more confident we are in the Lord, the more we will praise Him. The more we praise the Lord, the more confident we become in Him. So how about that? How about we, we try that? And, and we have there's no limit to where that'll take us. David had lived a life of many troubles, but could look back on, in confidence over how many times the Lord had rescued him. Can we do the same? Can we look back over our lives and see numerous times that the Lord delivered us from troubles? I promise you we all can. We can. What this should lead us to, to is great confidence in the Lord and infinite praise to his name with our whole heart. We should always have the confidence to know that whatever confronts us, whatever lays before us, all we simply have to do is to turn to God and to know that whatever promises we think he's made for us, he's going to deliver above and beyond that. Whatever we can imagine that we would like for God to do for us, whatever 
we think that God has laid out and said he'll do for us, we can't imagine how much more he wants to and will do for that. Something else I read, and we'll finish up here. That Psalm 138, <clears throat> this helps us to better understand what really happens when the Lord answers prayer. <clears throat> An answered prayer glorifies God's name. It gives witness to the lost. It accomplishes God's purposes in our lives. How many times has somebody seen you struggle with something and, and then they find out that you made it through it and then they find out how you made it through it? And when they find out how you made it through it, through prayer, that glorifies God's name. You're witnessing to the lost. That's what it does. It witnesses to them. And it accomplishes God's purpose for our lives. That's what God wants us to do. That's his will for us. To turn to him and to share, to let him bless us, and then to share with those around us what he did for us. And that he wants to do it for them. One last quote that I ran across is, you've probably heard this, the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth. It's not about us getting God to do what we want, to get our will done in heaven, but it's to get God's will done here on earth for us to do what God wants us to do. And are we demonstrating that in our lives? And with that, I'd like to explore the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day thankful, Lord, to know, thankful for your word, thankful for this psalm that David wrote, this psalm that you directed him to write, thankful to know that this applies to us but most thankful, Lord, to know your son, Jesus Christ, was that perfect, humble example that we can strive for. That he created the heavens and the earth, and he died on the cross for each and every one of us. I just pray, Lord, that we understand that our prayers are not for you to do what we would like, but for us to do what you would like. That when you answer our prayers, it's to it's your will, not ours. I just pray a blessing on the continued services here this morning and on each of us as we reach out into our community and share with those that you place before. In your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen.